So, konnichiwa and hello everyone. This session is about semi-formal verification of embedded Linux systems using traced-based models. Watashi wa Benno des. My name is Benno Bielmeier. I'm a research, uh, a research student at the Technical University of Applied Sciences in Regensburg, currently in my master's degree. About two months ago, I physically left my home university to join the Tokyo University of Sciences for starting a research internship. So that means gladly I have had already the op opportunity to um, yeah, experience Japan and, and Tokyo in particular quite a bit. So if there is anything you do not dare to ask the locals or your Japanese colleagues, you can go, uh, you can reach out to me after that talk. And with that that being said, I'll hand over to my co-speaker. Yeah, thank you very much. Also a uh, welcome from my side. And we, we're doing this crazy experiment of switching speakers all the time and turning on and off mics. So I'm Wolfgang Maurer. I've been told that means Maurer by my student. It may also mean person who makes me rehearse my slides all the time again and again. But who knows? Um, I see many, many known faces here. So you know I uh, work at Siemens Corporate Technology in the Corporate Competence Center embedded Linux and I also have a second hat at the Technical University of Applied Sciences in Regensburg where I had the digitalization laboratory and this talk basically came out of uh, two interests that I'm following in both roles. One is for the civil infrastructure platform where we as uh, Kate this morning very nicely introduced work on various topics that relate to safety critical to mixed criticality systems to yeah what keeps our civilization alive and academically we are a uh, associate partner at the ELISA project where safety and Linux obviously are likewise receiving a great deal of attention. So for those, uh, I guess that's very few people in the room who have never heard of mixed criticality systems or perhaps it's zero, so, but you know these come in many shapes and sizes and weights from uh, airplanes over trains to say um, medical uh, imaging devices. What all these devices have in common, although they are very, very much in, the, in their form factor, is that they have some portions that are safety critical. If these go wrong, then people will be harmed, people can die. And of course we do not want that, so that needs to be prevented at any cost. But they also have more traditional tasks to satisfy, functions to, uh, to fulfill, like um, in this place you have a, an onboard entertainment system that is probably not safety critical, so no one will die if the entertainment system fails, probably except if you are on a 26-hour haul from Melbourne to London without any stop and the entertainment system fails and you get a mutiny on board by the passengers, but that's then beyond uh, the control of technology. And actually, in this case, it's very simple to separate between the critical and the uncritical parts, so just don't let the entertainment system play with the engine control or with the flight regulation software and you're good, you can afford that in such a big system. When we look at trains, the distinction line becomes a bit blurrier. So you also have lots of software on trains, some of which is safety critical, some of which is not. But um, say in the traditional control systems that we're using, people start to employ Linux more and more, so there's not such a clear separation anymore. And when you go to these devices, here you have problems that you need to employ hard real-time control techniques, for instance in case of this machine, to control the electromagnetic pulses that are responsible for image generation, or in case of um, computed tomography machines, the doses that a patient is subjected to. But on the same, at the same time, you need to do large-scale data processing, throughput-oriented data processing on the same hardware, because you have a certain cost pressure going on these days um, in these systems. And of course, you want these systems to be not too expensive because obviously it's a good thing to have good healthcare available everywhere. So we are seeing more and more pressure to combine uh, critical use cases with uncritical use cases. Now, these devices have very little in common with what we are seeing Linux deployed on typically embedded Linux these days. But again, as we have learned in many interesting talks at this conference, Linux is seeing more and more adoptions, adoption in devices like this. So why are we doing this? Um, 
Well, actually, that raises two questions. What is the difference, and why are we doing that? The difference is clearly all these devices have safety requirements, which bring in security requirements. They very often have to satisfy real-time demands. And um, a point that we cannot go into detail in this talk, but that should also be mentioned, is sustainability for such devices is very important. You may throw away your mobile phone after two years in use. You certainly don't do that with a Boeing 747. Why are we doing that? Because consumers, users of these devices, always request more and more features, so we cannot use traditional engineering from the first screw upwards to build these systems, because cost and time are simply prohibitive factors. So, uh, to summarize our um, motivation, why do we need mixed criticality systems based on Linux? That's because there is a trend that has been going on for years towards using common off-the-shelf hardware. Industry is under pressure to build software-intensive control systems, so we rely on loads of software written before because we want to combine convenience features with the strict determinism that's required in such systems. And um, since you're all experts in open source software, I don't need to tell you that many elements of the traditional open source engineering process, like these self-organized, highly, often highly informal development processes, at least informal from the point of view of a safety certification, exist. The software is of high complexity. A Linux kernel is so infinite more complex than a traditional QNX or um, VxWorks real-time kernel, and uh, the software also changes rapidly. So we need new ways, and this has already been discussed by a number of talks at this conference, to arrive at systems that are A, safety critical, and B, we can prove they are satisfy the safety critical requirements. What makes it even more interesting is that this goes well beyond Linux. We need to um, we need to deal with um, other real-time kernels. We may need to deal with hypervisors that are becoming uh, tr standard parts of such software architectures. We need to include the middleware, so there's no kernel user distinction in this point of view. We just need to cover everything. And eventually, if you want to bring it down to two challenges, the two challenges are the processes that we employ, the development processes that in some way or another need to be made compliant with safety regulations. So it's about people to some extent. Extent, but also the technology itself needs to be up to the um, challenges, needs to, needs to, satis needs to um, satisfy the demands, it needs to uh, provide the sufficient real-time guarantees and so on. So it's two things we need to look at. For this talk, we're focusing on the technology and our um, efforts in that direction. And Philip Arman, since you are all very technologically advanced and have your time machines at hand, uh, gave a very interesting talk on Monday yesterday, so set them to Monday 11 o'clock, and you will hear that what makes a system safe is assessing whether a system is safe requires understanding the system sufficiently, and that is precisely the motivation for our work, which ben -San is about to explain to you. All right, so we... So right, we so we heard uh, a little about challenges and problems and is issues with mixed criticality and real-time systems in general, and what we want. Uh, would like to have is something that gives us reliable statements or even guarantees about the uh, real uh, about the uh, runtime behavior and especially worst case latencies of these systems and the main uh, reason or the main point prohibit uh, yeah, pro uh, preventing us from doing so or doing so in a straightforward manner or uh, using established tools is the systems com uh, system complexity. So we came up with an approach con consisting of, of four steps on a conceptual level um, that is outlined here on the slide. And the, the, the core of this approach um, are two ideas. The first is simplification. So we take we, 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 uh, the simplification of the, of the system via modeling um, and abstracting its complexity. In, in the first step. And this is done via leveraging expert knowledge about the system. This is also the reason why it is called a semi-formal approach. 
And um, well, as we are in a domain of zero-based counting, there is actually a zeroth step hidden uh, that we just um, consider as a precondition, which is, well, if you're gonna model something, you actually have to know what you model. Um, so we just assume for this approach that you already have identified the scenarios that you are going to uh, consider for, for the verification uh, approach. And the second main idea is to gather empirical data about the runtime behavior and use this data to later on uh, extend the model and use for stochastical analysis. And to achieve this, to achieve um, gathering the data, we need um, some kind of system instrumentation. This is what the second step, the annotation part, uh, is about. And um, so we use then that uh, instrumentation to um, yeah, gather the, the data in a, in a real world context in production, um, yeah, extend the model and eventually derive um, statements about properties um, of, of the system. So let's dive into the single steps. So, but before I again hand over to my co-speaker, I just want to mention um, that we are going to use a deterministic finite automata as a model link type, um, but you might also know them as state machines. Yes, um, deterministic finite automaton state machines, tomato, tomato, doesn't really matter how you call them, as long as we can all agree that the correct spelling of color has an O and a U in it. But um, I see that everyone agrees with me. Um, you don't? Okay, but maybe let's, let's shift aside that discussion. <laughs> um, what are the properties that our model should have? So we are abstracting away from the system somewhat and um, we'd like our model ideally to have three properties, generality, realism, and precision. So it's getting a bit academic here, but um, thing is, it, it makes sense to consider these three dimensions because generality means that the model, and I guess we should have chosen a slightly larger font size, is applicable to multiple real world situations. I mean, that's what the whole idea of abstraction is about. You make, take a system, you make it simpler, and then this pattern applies to many, many instances of different systems. We can have realism, that means the model accurately represents real world phenomena. The model behaves in exactly the same way as the system does. Of course, this is a bit in a contradiction to generality because either we want to abstract or we want things to behave exactly in the same way. But there's also the consideration about precision and that means the model minimizes the error between its own behavior and the real world behavior, meaning that we allow some differences between how the model behaves and how the real system behaves. But if we can bring these differences beyond a certain threshold that is acceptable for our use case, and trust me, regardless of what you are um, trying to certify, you will never for no standard whatsoever need a model that completely uh, um, behaves in the same way as the system itself. So some amount of error is always tolerable. And that's why we chose to go for these two properties, generality and precision. So we deliberately simplify systems to make um, the models tractable again in our analysis by sacrificing realism. So we don't go for a completely faithful model of the system, but we still ensure that uh, precision is possible to the desired level. So what have people done um, previously? to ensure, for instance, that real-time properties are satisfied. I guess many of you will know this nice test track built by Thomas Gleixner in Germany at the OSADL Foundation. Actually, they do not just have one, they have, I think, 18 of these, so don't want to foot their power bill. Uh, and what they do is they run all kinds of embedded systems with the latest real-time kernel, subject them to some load tests, and then measure for an 
a sufficient um, time duration and then determine the maximum. Okay, that works fairly well. On the other hand, uh, what academics would do is you go to the source code level, you just dispose of the whole system, so all this hardware is just a uh, minor detail, we don't care about that, let's go to the source code level and ideally count uh, all paths through the code and then determine the maximum. Of course, both approaches have their strengths and weaknesses. This, for one, is way too hard for any halfway realistic system these days and this one is a bit simplistic considering that there's uh, quite many things that um, influence the actual behavior of the system. So what our approach is trying to achieve is um, on the one hand to benefit from the simplification that this approach brings. Basically that's a model that represents a system by an input time in between output, then measure latency. So we can go for more complicated models that more faithfully represent the system, but we still do not do it uh, up to this standard, but we use our simplified model, then instrument the system as such to record information about the actual behavior that's then connected with a model, and then from the model we can infer the uh, quantities that interest us, be, this, uh, be that the worst case execution time, maximum latency, other properties, whatnot. And there's lots of statistics that you can throw at this problem. So we are not, we decided to not um, go too deep into that direction in this talk, so time's finite. But uh, there is a lot of established theory that we can use to that purpose and we're always happy to discuss that um, with you. So for this talk, we're focusing on the approach that we're actually doing. And here comes again our highly innovative flying speaker switch mechanism. So back we are to our previous model. Um, as I already said, we use deterministic finite automata. Why? Because they are simple and yet powerful enough for our purposes and the later stochastical analysis. And I just want to highlight that the model states do not have to correspond to, to the system's states on a, on a technical level, in technical sense. Um, so these kind of effective states um, can be um, abstract representations of, of anything reaching from a, a tiny uh, block of code to, to whole models, uh, modules. So, um, and, and the implication of that is that we are not limited to the technical boundaries of the underlying lying, um, implementation. So this enables us to model on a global and system-wide level. Um, for example, combining some, some, some internals of the kernel with uh, user space um, things, or uh, taking, a, a count, uh, taking a bi um, proprietary binaries like the firmware into account in such a modeling approach. This model is actually um, modeling a, a synthetic real-time application we are going to use during the, the, the next couple of slides uh, to show and demonstrate the next steps. So now that we have a model, um, the next thing, uh, thing is instrumenting our system. As I already said, um, this, this is kind of, um, we merge our formal model into our system um, and defining there the states and transitions we are interested in. And it might already be clear, but I just want to stress that uh, we are not only interested in the, in the um, execution path token, but also in, in the precise timing, so time, time uh, information, and also some further information about the, the, the context of the execution, which might help us to bring a total order for the state changes uh, when we deal with um, concurrent execution. So when it comes to tracing, um, Linux provides a, a bunch of, of mechanisms uh, as well um, in, uh, in the kernel as well as on the user space side and on the, in, in the user space with and without the kernel involved. Um, and certainly this is not, uh, choosing the right one is, is not simple. 
Um, therefore, we're going to give you uh, a short overview of the mechanisms we considered so far. Um, yeah. So we just just a few of them. We we had. Um, uh, trace points, uh, static trace points with custom handlers in the kernel. We we uh, we used trace points with ftrace and the uh, the interface in debug fs. We use custom probes and also custom handlers. Uh, so basically, just uh, inserting some C function calls. Um, we um, tried K probes, user probes, uh, user static defined uh, trace points, uh, user events, and also some more advanced mechanisms like LTNNG and eBPF. And as we are not only um, interested in the domain of what the tracer is capable to, to measure and trace, um, and as in the first uh, column, um, we are also interested in, well, is it, is it a dynamic approach? Is it, um, does it have static uh, probes? And um, also we, are, we don't want to restrict ourselves to one technical um, and technical implementation or, or tracing domain. So we are basically looking for some yeah, um, approach tracer that is, uh, that is able to, to gather um, or combine data from different sources, from different scopes and domains. And also, uh, we want to record the data, uh, data as realistic as, um, as, as, possibly, uh, as possible. Uh, we want to keep the required changes um, at a bare minimum. So we try to use out-of-the-box tools and, and approaches. That is, the, that is what, what, was what the mainline column is for. And um, as, a, as a last note, we are on the right, uh, very right hand side, we just um, outlined our experiences um, regarding usability of the, yeah, of, the, of the traces regarding the annotation and measurement step. So as you can see, it is yeah, quite uh, colorful um, and there is not one perfect solution so um, it highly depends on your model and scenarios uh, which uh, tracer and which um, instrumentation um, you should pick or um, suits best. So is there any author of the involved tools here who would like to correct our highly subjective assessment of utility and ease of measurement? No, then it's probably correct. All right, so we have a model. We have the system instrumentation, so we have some some trace points um, marked in in our in our system in our code. So now we can start measuring the the real time behavior of the system. And just as a, a again a short reminder, this is our model of the synthetic real time application, um, comprised of six states. And um, yeah, they are kind of representing the essentials regarding our scenario that we consider. And well, measuring how could something look like that? Well, um, we get basically a log of, of events, as I already said, um, um, about with information about the code path that was taken and also the time information. Um, we take then this um, data and, as I said, extend or annotate our um, model. And this could be visualized something like that. So now we have each transition um, represented by one box um, with its, its name in the first row and in its body. The latency values are, um, are drawn as, as a histogram. 
the blue line indicates the uh, smooth kernel uh, density estimation and the red vertical bar is the worst case latency that we measured during our uh, yeah, measurement uh, scenario or run consisting of 100 runs of the, of the uh, application. So now the big question is how realistic is the data representing our system modeled? And to clarify that, we increase the number of runs we, we measure. And as you will see, uh, with increasing number of, of measuring data, uh, the distribution of the latency values converges towards an actual uh, distribution of the, of the latency values. And also the, la the worst case latency will shift to the right, uh, which makes sense as uh, when we gather more data, it is um, the, the probability is higher that we catch an, an rare ca case of, of, uh, worst of an increased um, worst case latency or scenario. So yeah, these are 200 runs and you see, as already said, the, 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 um, the distribution sh sharpens a little. Yes. So the, 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 um, the following question is, when do we have enough data? And there are many options in, st in stochastical analysis, but certainly this is out of scope for now, but we are open to discuss that um, afterwards um, or in break. So, um, in order to get back to something that you are probably um, more familiar with when you do traditional real-time systems analysis, in a, say, a cyclic test experiment, what you measure there is a point into the, so some signal gets into the system, is processed, gets out of the system. From that automaton point of view, that would correspond to any path from where the signal comes in to a possible exit of the signal, of which we have a number. So we could follow these paths one, two, three, or one, four, six, or one, two, five, four, six, and so on. Uh, in that simple model, that's limited. But eventually, if we Combine the data ex post that we gathered, we can regain these usual diagrams of global latency distributions. Again, here you see how it converges uh, once we increase the um, number of measurement runs, but that's very standard. The important thing is we get that out of the measured data and out of the model, but could also look at different things. We could look at uh, more specific paths. We could um, look at yeah, whatever, you, whatever you desire, basically. Um, one important thing is also we can combine multiple models. So as Benno mentioned, we have some distributions that are wider, some that are sharper, and that's an indicator of how faithfully typically we model the system. So here we have lots of unobserved noise that can be in the Linux kernel example, for instance, caused by interrupts perturbing the control flow or not. You can also model that with an automaton, then analyze this automaton, get information on that and see how that interacts with the different automaton and so on and so on and so on. So we have lots of possibilities to combine that. But that concludes basically the process that we are following and the approach um, to our measurements. So now we come to the final fun part. Um, so far we've shown you a synthetic model of yeah, a synthetic uh, application. Um, but of course, the approach also applies to, to real world scenarios. And we took as an, as an example, the IRQ handling process, which conceptually consists of, of the three steps. We receive an interrupt, we process uh, the interrupt, and based on the processing, we trigger some, some reaction. And the system instrumentation of that model could be look uh, like on the right hand side. So uh, again, the, 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 the three steps also represe um, are represented there. We, we get an, uh, an interrupt, we kind of handle that and um, react based on the, on the, pro on the processing um, in the handler. Um, 
so we have kind of the same same base pattern on the, on the conceptual level and on the system instrumentation. When it comes to the measuring part, you might be now familiar be be familiar with with the, the representation. So again, we um, have the histogram of the latency values with the worst case latency indicated by the red line um, and the density estimation in, in blue. One might now wonder why are there only three transition and back in the model four? Well, this is due to we are not interested in the latency between finishing processing an, an interrupt and the start of the next interrupt because yeah, we are not interested. So yeah. Yeah, so obviously, so it's it's impossible to capture then like um, 17 more realistic use cases that we can apply this model to. And actually, that is something that we would be interested in to hear from you and from the um, engineers actually building these safety critical systems. Where if you have interesting um, cases for us where we could apply these to, Beno-san will be in Tokyo until the end of uh, March, I think, and he has nothing to do anyway. So I assume. Um, so he'll be happy to assist you there. Actually, it turns out, so we did model a um, number of scenarios and with a few very simple patterns like this. A sequence, you can of course model loops um, very easily. You can um, model, so to model code paths and control flow instructions, you basically need a fork-like pattern where you can uh, um, process different code paths. You need some mechanism to join back code paths again. But with these four really simple, really elementary um, patterns, we've seen so far that you can really very satisfactorily provide models that reasonably well represent real world system situations. So, to conclude, uh, we've shown you our approach that somewhat mixes the experimental, empirical based um, traditional real time analysis with more academic approaches. We've shown you how to create such models conceptually. We've discussed that actually the communities provide many, many, many opportunities to uh, perform the required measurements, upstream or not. And we've shown you some examples of um, analysis. And having said that, let me conclude with the following statement provided to you by the great people at DeepL. So, thank you very much for your attention. And of course, open for questions. There's no question, then maybe let me make the comment that, of course, you all have heard about the um, verification framework that, uh, ah, so you have a question. So I skipped myself question, yes, and. So is there any actual project to, to apply this uh, model? So the question is, is there uh, any uh, any actual pro project or any... Oh, an actual yeah. project. Um, yes, so what, what we are looking at is indeed some uh, some some real-time control systems. So that's a job done in conjunction with Siemens technology. And so basically the things, so these um, devices that we showed before, medical devices of interest for that, uh, some uh, communication devices, um, some devices from um, the telecommunication industry that are starting to face these issues and basically everything that needs to be certified at a low level, uh, sorry, that needs to be certified at a reasonably low level of assurance so it's not ready for a uh, SIL uh, 4 or something. That was worth saying, but these devices that um, have safety requirements but do not necessarily kill people if things go wrong. Oh, okay, thank you. There are many cases to be yes. applied. Yeah, yes, already. Uh, I have uh, one question, and uh, how to uh, how to evaluate the difference between the mo model, uh, for example, the uh, state machine in this uh, in this slide, 
uh, and uh, between this slide, yes, and uh, real model. Uh, it's, uh, I guess it's very difficult to, um, it's difficult to evaluate uh, the whether uh, the, this model is uh, uh, near near the real system or not. It's, uh, I guess it's, uh, uh, it's uh, it was. Uh, it will be uh, revised uh, as a result of uh, analyze. Is it uh, is it correct? Yes, exactly. So of course the the modeling step. So that would be uh, this step here. Of course requires requires expert knowledge to yeah. build models. So as uh, Benosan mentioned, that's the zero step. You need to know what you want to model, yeah. and that crucially depends on people. Um, sufficiently understanding, coming back to my very first uh, slide, the system already, then we can create a model, then we can use this technique to populate the model and infer then because certification authorities are typically not interested in, so we say we understand our system sufficiently well, but they'd like to have hard data. And so the idea is to argue we have this model that is a simplified representation of our system, yet it was in this and that test, and again here we're coming to the statistics that we left out from the talk, we were able to show that it responds up to minor differences as the system itself does, and that gives you then the assurance that uh, the system works reasonably well. But yes, of course, it's an iterative process to refine the model again and again. Yeah, thank you very much. So, Tim. Okay, I'm going to ask the question that I think you're about to ask yourself. <laughs> how does this uh, how does this correlate with the recently introduced runtime verification subsystem? Oh yes, so that, that's an excellent question. I, I didn't expect it to say, but um, um, so the kernel actually introduced a runtime verification system by um, Red Hat and Daniel Bristow that has been under development in the real-time community for a number of years. Of course, we've discussed these ideas together. So if we go back to this very first slide, the main difference would be in that they're heading for a more or less realistic model of the system. So if I understand the paper and the discussions correctly, then they aim for something they can basically put into a theorem prover, and their models are extremely large. So their model for, I don't know what they have in the paper, I think it's task switching, but, um, don't pin me on that, it has about 9,000 states and I think 21,000 uh, transitions between the states. So that is something that you cannot really comprehend so that generating the models, but then you can use theorem provers to make statements about that model. And that's more in the direction of, um, I don't know if you're familiar with these L4 in, um, um, research initiatives, so they have a formal model and then they generate the kernel from that model and say, okay, everything the model does is also reflected in the kernel. That goes a bit in that direction. So they're shooting a higher, higher than us. Um, we, in contrast, go for these more or less um, simple models. So, of course, a real model has more states than that, but it should still be understandable by humans. And especially our intention is that we can explain the model to the certification authorities and they are credible to believe us that uh, this model um, accurately represents the system. Whereas with the 29,000 um, state model, that's then a totally different approach to certification. Thank you. Thanks. So I guess it's more or less time out anyway. So if there are no more questions. Uh, as I said, so we are happy to hear use cases from you for the students' entertainment <laughs> and joy. Um, and thank you again very much for your kind interest. Thank you.